Welcome. So thank you all so much for taking the time to attend. This webinar is run by the IUCN's National Committee UK's Education and Communication Working Group. My name is Sophie Stenson. I am the chair of the working group and it's a pleasure to be talking to you all today. For any of you new to the IUCN CEC, that's the Commission on Education and Communication. So the purpose of this UK working group is to support the work of IUCN's global CEC and its initiatives. And Oh, I can hear someone. There we go. <laughs> uh, so as I was saying, um, the purpose of the working group is to support the work of the IUCN's global CEC and its initiatives. And we aim to bring together individuals and organisations that are passionate about nature conservation and also facilitate collaboration. The IUCN CEC has been an important actor in the interpretation and realisation of communication and education work as part of the CBD and is also involved in the intergovernmental sphere by participating in the Conference of the Parties, COP processes, um, on advisory committees and other major conventions and events. We also complement the work of other NCUK working groups with experts on, climate, on the climate crisis, um, ecosystem restoration and protected areas, just to name a few. So if you're interested in becoming a member of the CEC or any of the IUCN commissions, um, individual membership is completely free and you can find out more by following the link that I will share in the chat box um, just in a minute. Uh, and I'll also share a QR code at the end of the presentation. There's also more information about the working groups on our website. If you follow the link again, I will share in the, in the chat box. Um, and these links will also be shared to you via email following the webinar. So this evening is the sixth in our webinar series so far. In our previous webinars, we've discussed the importance of conserving conservationists and their mental health, topics of nature education for sustainability, youth engagement, and the role of zoos in conservation. So if any of those interest you and you'd like to learn a bit more, you can find the recordings on our website or YouTube channel by searching IUCNNCUK. We're also looking forward to our next webinar where we'll host Laura Soul and her team from the UK Department for Education and the Natural History Museum. And they are working on the UK's nature education strategy. And that will be on the 31st of July, also Monday, um, 6 p.m. till 7 p.m. So without further ado, we are really looking forward to hearing from our expert speaker tonight on the theme of nature connectedness. Professor Miles Richardson is a chartered psychologist, chartered ergonomist, and ergonomist, if I, that sounded like economist, didn't it? Um, and professor of human factors and nature connectedness at the University of Derby. So he founded the award-winning Nature Connectedness Research Group, which aims to understand and improve connection with uh, nature to unite both human and nature's well-being. The group works closely with Natural England, and its work has been adopted by many organisations, including the National Trust, RSPB, and the 2021 Mental Health Awareness Week. So Miles is also the creator of Biodiversity Stripes and a lead author on the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, Global Transformative Change Assessment. Um, and his book, Reconnection, Fixing Our Broken Relationship with Nature, was recently published in April 2023. So I'd encourage you all to go and have a look at that. Uh, so over to you, Miles. Yeah, thanks, Sophia. And um, hello, all, and thank you for reading out about the best lead authorship, because that's uh, always really difficult um, to get through. Yeah, so um, I, I'm going to talk about nature connectedness, what it is, why it matters, and how to improve it. I've, I've kind of put quite bit more of a bias onto pro-nature conservation behaviours because I think that would be uh, of interest and I'll, I'll touch on a couple of topics that were just mentioned on, about previous talks and upcoming talks like education so hopefully it'll be of interest. Um, I've got a lot of slides but that's kind of why I do it, I kind of flick through them pretty quick and I'll, I'll try and uh, uh, keep that and keep to time as well. I might just switch my video off while I'm talking and so you can focus on the on the slides and uh, saves a bit of bandwidth as well. So here we go. Let's just make sure I've got things correct. There we go. Yes. So uh, you won't need reminding of, of, of much of this. Um, we have the warming climate. There's the school strikes there. 
there's a, 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 a wildlife and biodiversity crisis um, and I think the mental health crisis as well we can we can see that as a sign of our failing relationship with the rest of the natural world and that four minutes 36 if you're wondering what that is that is a study that we did in Sheffield in the UK where we used um, people's smartphones to, to track average time they spent in green space each day. So that was the median time, four minutes, 36 seconds, just another indication of how uh, little time we spend in nature uh, as, a, as a kind of, as a routine kind of um, uh, everyday experience, I suppose. And another way of looking at our failing relationship with nature, there's quite a few. This is just a simple chart that shows um, the use of nature related words in English fiction um, over the past few decades. And you get similar charts for um, film scripts, song lyrics and, and the like. And you can just see that there's, there's a decline in the use of, of nature words over the decades there. And another way of thinking about this is as nature has declined, the green line is the loss of biodiversity biodiversity since 1970 using the LPI index uh, and then the red line is just something from Google Engler at once the use of the word me which is quadrupled since 1990-ish um, so as we kind of lose interest in nature um, we refer to ourselves more and more captured quite neatly there by uh, the cartoon by Ralph and I don't normally include this chart in my, my slides, but it, it's, a, it's one I produced based on this research paper that was published this year. Um, it just shows the relative um, mass of various life forms on, on Earth. Um, it kind of speaks for itself. Um, the, we have a, a relationship with nature that's based on use of natural resources and control of natural resources to the point that uh, ourselves and our uh, cattle and in particular um, are, yeah, well, you can see the, the vast amount of, of um, mammalian life on Earth. So nature connection, we have a failing relationship globally and then here's a little insight into where our relationship with nature might, might be in the UK. So this is a chart that just shows the mean level of nature connectedness, uh, connection with nature, which I'll come on to a bit more uh, in a few slides time, um, against well-being in this instance. Um, but what you can see within this uh, circle here is that the United Kingdom is kind of almost next to bottom on, on this sample of, of nations. And another observation within the, within the blue line is they're kind of all English speaking nations, former parts of the, of the British Empire. So there seems to be something about the way uh, we think about nature and our relationship with nature that uh, um, has a long history. Um, and we've done a bit of research to understand why or start to unpick why it's a kind of macro nation level so these are these are people's individual scores of nature connectedness but if you look at metrics for the entire nation um, what we found is there's seems to be a link between income and wealth and nature connection as, as wealth goes up nature connection goes down as the use of technology goes up the level of nature connection gets lower. There's a very strong link to biodiversity. The more biodiversity there is, the higher the level of nature connection. Similarly, there's relationships to land use. The more pasture land there is, the lower a nation's uh, connection with nature. Uh, the more urbanization, as you might expect, uh, the lower the level of nature connection. And also we found an interesting link between the population age, you can measure it in different ways, but the more children they were, the lower the connection with nature. 
and vice versa, the more the older the population, the closer the connection with nature. So it's perhaps linked or a sign of the shifting baseline syndrome where older generations have more nature about to, to connect with and develop a relationship with. So this is the same stat, just um, to emphasize the fact that the UK is at the bottom of this uh, group of nations in terms of their nature connection. And you can see biodiversity and well-being there as well. And it's kind of no surprise, we're quite close to the bottom of biodiversity and we're quite close to the bottom of well-being as, as well as nature connection. But we perhaps see ourselves as a, a nation of nature lovers. And so this might come as some surprise. We cherish our artists and poetry that refers to the natural world and we love our nature documentaries and we live in this green pleasant land, but it doesn't seem to be borne out in these statistics. Um, so I'm kind of setting out that we've got a failing relationship with nature. And thankfully, there's global recognition that that relationship with nature is broken and a sustainable future requires a new relationship. Uh, it's a bit of a going back to the previous chart. So there's global recognition of a global, global failing relationship with nature, but the UK seems to be bottom or towards the bottom of that. So that doesn't put us in a very good, good place. So these are a few of the documents that are starting to talk about our relationship with nature. Uh, and the COP15 agreement, target 12, I think, refers to connection to, with nature. So it's beginning to, beginning to appear in policy documents. And if we're talking about our failing relationship with nature, this is something that I explore um, more fully in my in the book. But this is just a, a quick overview. But if we take a very long view as, as to why we obviously had our uh, prehistory evolving and living within the natural world with a very very close bond uh, within the natural within the natural world. And then there's been revolutions in agriculture that took place over hundreds and hundreds of, of years, a slow process, then more rapid um, revolutions in science, the industrial revolution, the kind of current technological revolution that we're perhaps going through. And we've ended up with a modern life uh, that is mainly within uh, buildings and the built environment. Uh, we've ended up with the loss of biodiversity is reflected in the, in the in the lower picture there, and we we're realising that, and we're starting to treat the symptoms. So we're trying to use less resources and energy in terms of greener consumption and greener sources of energy, and we're looking to restore nature. But I think my take is that we also need to look at the root cause of, of those and restore our relationship with nature. So you can see climate warming and the loss of biodiversity as symptoms of that failing relationship with the natural world. And this it always surprises me that we spend so much energy trying to, to, to show that humans need nature and that our broken relationship with nature might be might be a cause of some other issues because we wouldn't question that fish need a river or birds need the sky or apes need a forest but we spend tens of millions of pounds in research showing that humans benefit from the environment of their evolution as, as well but that's all quite depressing um so here's here's a bit of hope and a sign of those latent connections uh, that we are like fish and birds and apes in that you can find signs of those latent connections in the laboratory findings in quite magical ways as, in a way. If you place sensors on people and um, monitor their physiological response, you will find out that standing in a woodland or sitting in a woodland, just being in a woodland, you can, you can monitor the effect that that has on the human physiology. It calms the nervous system helps manage our emotions. And you can get the same effect by 
simply looking at a picture of some roses for three minutes. These are studies that have been done in, in research laboratories. And also, quite surprisingly, uh, if you blindfold someone and ask them to place their palm on various materials, you'll find that same effect as standing in a woodland uh, simply by placing one's palm on some untreated wood. So the body kind of seems to have this innate um, realization when it's when it's viewing or in touch with the products of the of the natural world or elements of the natural world. And the mic microbes there kind of are there just to indicate the research that shows if you live or if people live nearer a richer environment, greater diversity of uh, of microbes and the microbiome that lives on and within us um, is more diverse and that has a positive impact on our well-being. So another sign of those innate connections or invisible connections. And similarly, the amygdala, the, the base of the brain, which manages our emotions and plays a role in emotional regulation, that is better developed in people who grew up near woodland, for example. So you've got these uh, examples of how we still have this latent connection to the natural world, even if when questioned subjectively, we might not quite realize that we are part of the natural world. So there's the physical connections, which brings me on to the, the psychological connection. So what is, what is nature connectedness? And it's different to contact and exposure to nature. So it's different to visits to nature. It's different to just simply being near nature and the benefits that that can bring. It's a psychological construct that's internationally recognized and it's a person's sense of their relationship with the natural world, both emotionally and cognitively. So that emotional bond that we might have towards nature, but also that cognitive belief that we are part of nature or cognitive realization rather than belief that we are part of nature. And we can measure that with psychometric scales, which allows us to do science and um, measure the impact of uh, and the benefits of having a closer relationship with nature. It's also a construct that provides some clarity in that um, it provides a definition within the fragmentation of what connection with nature means. And so the research is starting to suggest that that link to nature is a basic psychological need. And I'll show uh, share a little bit of research that shows that it unites both human and nature's well-being. So this is the why nature connectedness matters. So this is just um, an example of the well-being benefits. You can see the, the list of, of benefits around the side there, broadly about people feeling good or functioning well. So feeling good, vitality, happiness, etc. Et and then functioning well, meaning and purpose, life satisfaction, personal growth, aspects like that. And there's also some suggestion that there's links to pro-social behavior and body image and other, other well-being benefits. And when you combine measuring people's nature connectedness with measuring their nature visits in cross-sectional research, you can find that nature connectedness matters more for well-being, certain aspects of well-being, like having a worthwhile life, than does visiting nature. So that's research that's emerged over the last few years where um, previously the focus had been perhaps time in nature, visits in nature, but if you measure in tandem nature visits and nature connectedness, you get some different results. Um, and the, the explanation of well-being or having a worthwhile life uh, for nature connectedness was four times as much as socioeconomic status, which is accepted as a benchmark kind of indicator of having a worthwhile life. So that's just the results of one survey. It gives you an indication of, of why nature connectedness matters, but there are systematic reviews that, that show that link from multiple studies now. There's been dozens of studies into, into that. Similarly, um, why nature connectedness matters and this is what we try to focus on a little bit more than people's well-being, is nature's well-being. So there's been systematic reviews again that have shown a strong and robust 
link between nature connection and pro-environmental behaviours. And there is some evidence that there's a causal link as well. So if you improve nature connection, it increases the pro-environmental behaviours as well. And this is a kind of virtual circle. Good for nature, good for you is a, is a phrase we've been using for, for, quite a, for quite a while. And you can see human exposure to nature is, is good for people. There's, there's, there's decades of research that has shown that link. Um, but what our focus is, is if you get that engagement with nature, that emotional bond, the noticing nature and the engagement with this, the simple things in the natural world, you can get more well-being and you can get pro-nature behaviours as well, which is indicated by the, the circle on the right there. And then just a little bit more to, to explain the concept of nature connection. This is the results from a, a population survey of nature connection in the UK a few years ago, but it was the first, it was the first one, so it was significant. And we found that the mean level of nature connection in the UK was 61, which doesn't mean a great deal on its own. But you can see there the discarded coca. The people who report doing nothing for nature or the environment, their mean level of nature connection was 47. The people who report recycling, which is perhaps the easiest pro-environmental behaviour to do because we have recycling bins and collections, for example, their nature connection level was 63. So we're doing a little bit more and your nature connection was a little bit higher. But for people who said that they did active pro-conservation volunteering, the level was 76. So you start to get this picture of the higher the level of nature connection, the more likely you, like, the more you do for nature and the environment. And here's the full list. You can see that as the behaviors perhaps need more commitment, the level of connection required to be involved or associated with being involved goes up and the number of people who do them goes down. So volunteering to help the environment needs a nature connection of 76, but there was only 4.8% of people said that they, they did that. And once you start measuring nature connection across the lifespan, you can get a chart like this, which shows that it's high, in childhood and then goes down through the teenage years, that's the teenage dip, and then it grows through young adulthood, adulthood to go back towards the, the mean and, and level off in the, in the kind of decades from 30 onwards. Um, so that's what nature connection looks across the lifespan. I think we can all hazard a guess at what happens during the teenage years when interpersonal relationships probably matter a little bit more or a lot more. The relationships with the natural world and then that green line is the 76 this is, there's nothing more scientific than that but it, it just shows where um, we need more people to be up around 76 if you think the 76 is associated with pro-nature behaviors um, so quite a way to go so these hopefully you've, you've seen the climate warming stripes on the top and then you'll have, you'll, you'll have seen the biodiversity stripes that I produced last uh, summer on earlier slides. You might have seen them uh, more widely because they're, they're beginning to share, be shared a bit, a bit more. These are them linked together. So this is 1970 onwards, and it just shows as the climate um, warms, biodiversity has been getting uh, lower as well. And obviously, they're interrelated, but there's different factors associated with both. And the reason I'm just putting this there now is I just wanted to highlight that um, the behaviours associated with both are different. So in the research that we've done, we've looked at the difference between pro-environmental behaviours and pro-nature conservation behaviours, which is a distinction there's been surprisingly little thought on. So we have this huge disparity in awareness and psychological research into climate change compared to biodiversity loss, eight times as much uh, media exposure on, on climate change uh, than there is on the loss of wildlife. And that's reflected in, in, the, in the psychological research as well. The focus has tended to be pro-environmental behaviors, often 
broadly the carbon and resource focus and usually associated with positive in, in action so they use less energy or less carbon don't drive don't fly for example and then pro nature conservation behaviors are broadly behaviors related to habitat creation for example in your own garden um, and that can be seen as positive action as opposed to positive inactions and what we found in our research that psychologically there are different types of behavior uh, but nature connectedness seems to be linked to both so we did some of the first work on pro nature conservation behaviors um, and because surprisingly there wasn't a scale that measured pro nature conservation uh, behaviors before we developed one a few years ago so we did some of the first work on that and we started to look at these factors there there's eight factors of which ones predict um, or explain pro nature conservation behaviors and what we found was together those explained 70 percent of the variation of people's positive actions by nature which is quite a lot um, but we found the biggest um, factors were engaging in simple nature activities simply noticing nature that kind of living side of having a close relationship with nature um, they were that was the largest contributor and then some assumptions were kind of uh, you might think time in nature knowledge of study of nature and value of concern were important but they didn't emerge as significant they had no relation to to pro nature conservation behavior so nature connectedness can can bring some surprising results and challenge some assumptions um, I also like it as a, a metric so here is nature connectedness across about 18 countries and the relationship to uh, carbon emissions, very low there because that's kind of not related to individual behaviors, but to well-being and biodiversity, there is a strong relationship because I think generally if your country has a, a variety of wildlife, uh, it creates better conditions for having a close relationship with nature. Um, it's just interesting to compare it to the sustainable development rankings as well which is quite surprising those have a different relationship to well-being and biodiversity so a negative relationship across those nations um and then just a couple of kind of closing reflections on what the research is, has been showing is this just from this year there's been some studies that have shown or confirmed that people's relationship with nature, their psychological and physical connections to nature have been declining over time. Well, that's kind of always assumed, but there's, it's difficult to do that type of longitudinal research that's been done. And then, although there's these calls for a new relationship with nature, um, a couple of um, studies have found that that's not getting through in practice. So priority actions for nature conservation that focus on human nature connection uh, are yet to become mainstream um, and although it has nature connection as a, a, a positive link to sustainability um, that's being neglected by current public policies but well, hopefully that's starting to change with the, the global recognition that, that we, we need for a new relationship with, with nature and thinking in that relational way so hopefully that you've kind of seen enough evidence in that brief tour to think, well, nature connectedness seems to be quite a good thing. Um, so then we turn to how do we how do we increase nature connectedness? And you might think, oh, education, we need to we need to uh, teach more children about nature, and that will improve nature nature connectedness and improve pro nature behaviours. Well, what we find is that environmental education in recent systematic reviews wasn't particularly improving nature connectedness. And this study is an example of it, that increasing environmental knowledge only explained a very small proportion of ecological behavior in children, whereas nature connectedness explained a, a larger, much larger chunk of that. So to increase nature connectedness, we've been developing inter interventions over the years and we, started by simply getting people to notice the good things in nature each day and to write them down and we found that led to significant increases in mental health and nature connectedness and those were sustained for one month even if you did that 
for five consecutive days, we were still able to find traces of our uh, impact a month later. And we've also found that if you uh, get people to notice nature each day and write down the good things in nature that they see, that's linked to significant increases in pro-nature conservation behaviours as well. So this, this concept of simply noticing nature um, is really, seems to be really important. Um, but the trouble is, 80% of people rarely or never notice nature. They don't watch wildlife, smell wildflowers. Um, so that there's this kind of cultural disconnect from the natural world. And what we found in the lockdowns where people couldn't do much more than wander around in green space, and we saw um, lots of news about increased visits to green space, they went up by 40%. But we happened to be measuring nature uh, connection and noticing nature at that time. And we found that noticing nature increased more, 74%. And it was that increase in noticing nature during that time that was uh, explained more of the well being uh, people were experiencing and the level of pro nature conservation behaviors. So that simple noticing of nature that was increased because it was quieter, there was less to do, there was more time, and uh, that explained uh, well-being of pro nature conservation behaviors more so than the increase in visits to nature that happened at that time. And this is a, a, a diagram that just captures those uh, feedback effects. So you increase nature connection, uh, there's more pro nature behaviors, there's more nature to notice. Uh, if you notice the nature, it improves well being. The pro nature behaviors lead to more biodiversity, so there's more nature to notice, and that's related to well being as well. So it's just a, a little diagram to capture all those relationships that uh, are ongoing. So noticing nature each day is all is all well and good, and we can we can prompt people to notice nature, um, but that's not going to lead to any kind of meaningful transformation change in our relationship with the natural world. So another aspect of our work is the pathways to nature connectedness. And these, this is a design framework basically, and it's the type of activities uh, that you need to prompt across society or within, within groups of people as much as you can to improve their relationship with nature. And the pathways to nature connectedness, there's five of them, they're very straightforward. So you need to create um, circumstances, programs, communities, urban environments. You can, you can kind of apply this quite widely where people are more likely to have sensory contact with nature, more likely to appreciate the beauty of nature, and more likely to uh, turn to nature to manage their moods, to find joy, to find calm, and more likely to celebrate the meaning of, of nature in their lives, nature events and nature stories. Um, and creating environments where more people can help to care for nature. Because if we're lucky enough to have a garden, there's a certain amount we can do, um, but there could be um, wider um, possibilities for people to get involved in, in looking after the natural world. And then we also looked at what wasn't a pathway to nature connection, and we, we found these types of relationship with nature. It's quite surprisingly, perhaps scientific study of nature wasn't linked to nature connection. I mean, you can understand that if that was a cold, rational relationship without any emotion or meaning. It wouldn't be particularly related to nature connection. And then obviously the practical use of nature isn't, the control and dominance isn't, and nature at times can be scary. So the fear of nature isn't really related to a, a close relationship with nature. Either. So they're perhaps pathways for survival and progress rather than a sustainable relationship. And the way I like to sum that up is, like el elsewhere in life, a lasting and sustainable relationship comes through noticing emotion, finding beauty, meaning and compassion. And then the pathways have been used a huge amount. We're kind of starting to lose track of where they're being used. Dozens of, of 
organisations are, are using them. So a few examples right at the start of 30 Days Wild, we, we work with the Wildlife Trust to go through the activities involved in that. We work with the National Trust on 50 things and various other uh, ways that the, the pathways can inform their user visit, the user, uh, not user, their visitor experience. Um, and then we can apply to buy through schools and there's programs like Generation Green and Green Influencers, which are informed by the pathways. And as I've indicated, you can start to look at the design of places and how they uh, can encourage people to activate the pathways. And then this is just a quick example, which I won't go into because we started a little bit late and I want to leave some time for questions, but the changes don't have to be quite particularly radical. They can be quite straightforward. So this is a, an example of the change in one of the 50 things activities that went from climb a tree to get to know a tree. You can still climb it, but the emphasis is on getting to know the tree, whether you're up the tree or gazing up through it. And so, We've done a lot of work on understanding our relationship with the natural world um, and trying to implement that to apply it to help improve um, people's relationship with the natural world. And this is just a, a slide that I won't go into in detail, but it, it just with the Nature Connectedness Research Group has been going for 10 years now. So um, you've got this arrow of, of new relationship research and application. And guidance that we've been producing towards scaling up, like the work with IPBES and the policy work, uh, mental health interventions that we've developed, um, metrics and the measuring of nature connectedness, and then the pro nature behaviours that just captures the themes of the of the research that we've been doing and um, kind of shows um, how much interest there is through through the busyness of the slide, really. Um, and it's quite pleasing to see that um, a couple of dozen of our research papers have been cited dozens of times in uh, 49 reports from 29 policy bodies in 12 countries. So you can see how the research into nature connection is starting to, to be noticed. Um, and that most cited papers relate to that link to well-being, the, the link to pro-environmental behaviors, and the link to pro-nature conservation behaviors. And the paper that I've written on scaling up the pathways to nature connectedness, how, how we um, change at a societal scale our relationship with nature, which is obviously the type of transformational change that might be needed, but is really difficult to, um, to achieve. And this is, I suppose, that increasingly the focus of, of our work is, is how do you move from individual programs where we try to connect groups of people with uh, nature to, to scale it up for a more sustainable future. And I'm just trying to capture this in a, in a couple of slides where you might see the dominant relationship that we've had with nature for the past uh, century or two is about use and control and consumption of nature that's led to a warming climate and the loss of biodiversity. So that's our red arrow, the dominant relationships for survival and progress, you might argue. And then in the green arrow, we've got fostering the pathways relationships, closer relationships with nature, where there's more nature, more engagement with nature, and we notice, enjoy, and celebrate and care for nature in a good life, hopefully, because when you increase nature connection, you get the benefits of mental well-being and pro-nature behaviours and pro-environmental behaviours. So we hope that that closer relationship with nature provides a positive vision um, where you can lead a worthwhile life um, with nature and a more sustainable life, whereas sometimes the story is a life without. And there's just some thoughts on transformational change there. How, how, do, we, how do we get transformational change across society with a green arrow? And I think that is about creating positive visions, of a more sustainable future with a closer relationship with nature, creating opportunities for people to get involved in those and to develop those opportunities, and then develop actions and activities where people can do that and ensure engagement and feedback. And that, I've got time to cover that in more detail, that starts to be where you, you look at policy as 
as how you um, fill the lots, for example, so that nature is celebrated more. And then another concept that we tend to talk about is leverage points. Uh, it's kind of quite intuitive when when you when you see it, but when we're trying to move this uh, immovable object, which is our failing relationship with nature, you, you use a, a long lever. But what we find in the leverage points research is 99% of the effort goes on to standards and parameters which are of shallow leverage points and don't have that much impact. And the longer uh, at the other end of the, of the stick is the aims and the mindsets and the values and the social norms and trying to trying to change them and uh, that sometimes that can be the, the simplest change of the aims on a piece of paper within an organization's uh, aims but um, that can be very difficult to achieve so you can see here that you need for transformation of change, you have to look at aims and values, the design of social structures and design of organizations and feedback loops and the way information is shared um, and not just parameters and, and standards. So that's that kind of scaling up work and trying to think in terms of leverage points. So there's much more, because that was very quick kind of tour through the uh, nature connectedness uh, research, but there's there's much more on scaling up than the, the history of our relationship with nature and the science of nature connectedness in the book, as you'd expect. And then if you don't want to read a whole book's length, there's the Nature Connection Handbook uh, that's available from my blog that has had over 36,000 downloads the last time I counted. Uh, there's a really good policy briefing from the um, the Mental Health Foundation, which they took on research and really made it kind of come to life in a policy way. Uh, and there's a couple of other briefings, one that we've done with the, the National Trust and Nature of So there's there's plenty of ways of finding out more. There's always more on my blog at findingnature.org.uk. And we also offer a MOOC as well, so you can learn more about it on an online course. So I'm going to things to a close there just so that we can have any uh, questions and answers. But my summary is pretty simple, really. Um, I think the warming climate and loss of biodiversity show that we have a, a failing relationship with nature, particularly the UK, sadly. Um, you, nature connectedness can unite both human and nature's well-being, which I think is a really useful combination. So it provides a really tangible target for change, change in our relationship with nature. Um, and fostering a new relationship with nature is possible, and that supplies, provides a positive vision for a sustainable future of living with rather than without. So that's the end of my slide. I'm happy to, to take, some, take some questions. Thank you so much, Miles, and thank you for take, taking the time to talk to us about your work today, because it's it's such an interesting topic and I'm sure that there's there's already some questions I've seen come up in the chat and I'm happy to read those out um, for anyone that doesn't want to um, kind of switch on their recordings. Um, or if you'd like to put your hands up, um, then I'm happy to kind of share and point towards any questions there. Um, so I might start with one that I already have written down, which was from Michelle Doa. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, and she's curious if you can pinpoint the kind of me focus. Uh, she's asked what happened or is it just a conglomerate of things? I don't know, Michelle, if you want to expand on that, if you're happy to unmute. Sure, um, I, I'm happy to do that. So, it, you know, a few of us have been talking about, like, is there, is is there a moment, some specific moments where that real shift from we to me took place? It, can you pinpoint anything? Yeah, I suppose that it's not something I can pinpoint. And I suppose it, it's probably, it might be difficult to, to, to bring it down to, to a very particular instance in time, but it, it does seem to be in relatively recent 
decades, as you can see from that, that chart where the, the rising mean started quite sharply. There's been other analysis as well, even, even in things as simple as song lyrics, there was a shift where they started um, to think about me rather than you. Songs typically referred to someone else and you were singing your song to them. And then the lyrics changed to people singing about themselves. So I think there's a wider um, body of research into, into um, narcissism and, and topics like that, which is, is not my focus of my research. And, uh, but there is, a, there is a concern that um, traits like that have increased and that that presents quite a significant conservation challenge because people are thinking about themselves more and more, whether it's to do with social media or, 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 or things like that. Perhaps that uh, has, has been quite an important factor in the, in the past perhaps decade or so, but it was pre, pre-dating social media as well. So I think there's, there's other factors at play. I don't know, Michelle, whether you'd like to um to to expand on your other questions as well. I've seen you've got a few others in the chat box there. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. What was the uh, <laughs> the other one? Um, uh, let me go back and see if I can oh, that's find okay. it. I've got yeah, a record okay. here. <laughs> um, yeah. So one of the things that because I do some nature connection work myself, and uh, I work in the conservation field, and one of the things that I'm that I notice is that uh, people just want to connect people to nature and not intentionally talk about reciprocity, right? They just assume it's going to happen by osmosis. And what if we talked about reciprocity as an intentional piece of any of our nature connection programs? Yeah, well, I, I think that's important because I, I talk about the similarity in passing I put that slide up that, that suggested the similarity between people's relationship with nature and people's relationship with with other people um, and there's lots of parallels between interpersonal relationships and human nature relationships but the the, the big gap is as as you were saying um, with other people, you get some feedback. It's a very much a, a very clear and obvious two-way um, relationship. But I think there are other ways of knowing that we're kind of schooled out of, so that we we kind of have quite a rational relationship with nature. But you can have more of a two-way relationship with nature. But I don't think we're kind of schooled to to think in that way. So finding ways to to bring that those other ways of knowing into people's lives is, is, uh, is needed and, and would be valuable. Absolutely, thank you so much. Um, I can see that we've got uh, some hands up from the audience as well. So we'll go to Mark first. Hi, my ask good to see you. Um, it's always me asking you questions. I've got another one for you today. <laughs> We've been running some nature connection workshops for our staff over the last few months. And it made me start, a comment that one of the members of staff made, made me think about what we can learn from the indigenous communities. I know this is something we've talked about in the past because they, they were talking about, they've been to, on holiday to Australia and someone from one of the indigenous communities in Australia had taken them into the, the forest. And as they went into the forest, they knelt down on the ground and they asked the permission of the trees in the forest to enter. And my colleague was telling me this, she said, it just felt absolutely natural and it felt like the right thing to do. But she said, if I'd have come back to this country and taken some people for a walk in the woodlands and done the same thing, they would have thought I was completely bonkers. So how do we get around that and really try and bring in those bits from indigenous culture that could really help us to get that two-way relationship? Well, yeah, I mean, that's the one of the key questions, isn't it? And um, I'm not an expert in indigenous peoples and communities but you know I, I, I've read about similar stories in, in Aboriginal 
uh, peoples and and the non-existence of the word nature, for example, mm. because there is no need for the word word nature when when you are part of it. And uh, and I think we're learning now of of how um, woodlands, for example, since you mentioned woodlands, are not just a collection of individual trees, but there's, there's interrelationships ongoing there, and we any kind of input from other, well, I suppose, artificial or human inputs can can, can in, impact the balance. But how we go about creating a culture or a social norm where, um, you know, we, we, we ask permission to enter a woodland before we do it. Um, well, if anyone's got the answer to that, I think please send them in, because I think that's, that's the real, the real difficulty. And I, I think, I do suspect that perhaps children would understand that at a very young age yeah. and have that, um, that kind of animistic relationship with the natural world. But I think, as I say, I think we're schooled out of it as that isn't that we're schooled to that being an error. If we think that trees and other parts of the, the natural world are alive, as a child kind of naturally kind of assumed sometimes and that we're kind of schooled out of that to to divide to divide natural bonds up into their parts and understand by separation rather than through relationships but no i, I don't have any grand answers of, of how we do that and i think that's the that's the challenge of, of finding that new way of knowing and bringing it into a modern a modern technological society. Yeah, what you said has just made me think perhaps it's not so much about getting that feeling into people, it's stopping bashing it out of people because you start with that as a child and we, society and the way that it's set up bashes that out of us gradually. Yeah, no, I, I think that's exactly the, the thought I had earlier in the year that hadn't occurred to me particularly before. It's not, we put a lot of effort into reconnecting people with nature and reconnecting children with nature. Well, perhaps we need to flip it on its head and, and not disconnect them in the first place. Because mm. I think, you know, um, our, our birth into this world is perhaps the most natural moment we ever experience, not that we can remember it. And then we become kind of more and more kind of not more and more rationalistic and, and of, of our culture as, as, as the years, as the days and years go by. Brilliant. Thanks, Miles. Absolutely. I think that's so interesting, especially, you know, thinking about nature as a separate term and the, the need for that at all is a, is a fascinating kind of concept. Um, I'm aware that we're sharing some uh, links in the meeting chat as well. And I'd like to say if anyone wants to share any links to any of the topics, projects that are mentioned, we can also share that with the recording and the blog afterwards. Um, and we will go on to the future questions as well. I'm just aware as we're coming up to seven o'clock. Um, to let everyone know that if you do have to leave at seven, um, we can also share the recording to you so you can keep up with any of the questions afterwards. But if, Miles, if you're happy to stick around for a few more questions, we're happy to keep going. Yeah, a couple more questions. I've got, okay. my, I've got a bit of my evening uh, wandering around the natural world, but I can, well, there's two hands up, so I'm very happy to, to take those two questions. Fantastic. Yeah, we won't, we won't keep you into the early hours of the morning. <laughs> so um, I'll hand over to Simon next. Uh, thanks, Miles. Really fascinating. Um, I'm interested in uh, the causal link between connection to nature and pro-nature behaviours, and I wonder whether there's any uh, distinction between very local behaviours, things people can see them around them, i.e. doing something nice in their garden or making a hole for a hedgehog or something, and then more distantly related behaviours like where your pension is invested or buying correct products so you're not deforesting places around the world, you know, sustainable palm oil, etc. Is, is, is the causal evidence very much to do with local nature-related related, behaviour or is, is there any evidence at all that translates into wider pro-environmental behaviour? Yeah, I think it, it's... There's been more work on pro-environmental behaviour that, that's broadly carbon reduction, um, you know, using less energy, for example. Mm -hmm. But there's 
very little research into pro nature conservation behaviors and pro nature behaviors because as a, as a kind of briefly mentioned th there wasn't a scale for that because i think even the, the psychological community has been that focused on on the climate side that the, the nature side didn't get a look in so um we only developed the scale perhaps four years ago so we've not had the opportunity to do that level of research it is split into um local personal actions and societal actions so there is there is a little bit of a suggestion that yes uh there are different types of behavior but you can you can look at the effects on the things that we can do in our garden and then how we might vote for example or how we might um push the um, as you say the kind of investment in i don't know whether it's shares or something the, the way that your pension is invested or something like that so yeah they are distinct and different but we just got a lot further to go because we've just not been focusing on those behaviors which is another side of our disconnect really that we weren't particularly thinking about them as a as a as a community thank you more research needed as usual <laughs> well yes sadly i mean quite often i kind of think that you know the, the, there's quite an urgency to these topics and there's times where I kind of think well yes you might need more research to um, to find out some aspects of the best way forward but I think on some things that they just kind of intuitively make sense and I think if they intuitively make sense just to kind of go for it. <laughs> awesome thank you. That's great. And we just have time for Patrick's question last, I think. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Miles, um, for your insightful um, presentation. Um, I was rather curious because, um, I mean, um, this recent uh, decade has seen people um, beginning to have um, some negative direct uh, experiences with nature as a result of um, ecotourism activities that are expanding into um, um, protected areas. And also, I mean, people handling um, nature and wildlife, I mean, poorly. I was just curious because I just wanted to understand. Um, so how are these negative experiences, okay, impacting people's connectedness um, to nature? Yeah, I, I suppose that's probably not something that's had that much attention. So, I mean, I, are you thinking of, because you mentioned ecotourism there, I think it goes both ways, doesn't it? There's, there's the negative impacts of people on nature, which I think that's a, um, that's an issue because if we engage more people with nature, um, we tend not we tend to leave a trace wherever we go, and uh, so you've got that to manage. You want to engage people with nature, but you don't want people to disturb nature. So there's the negative experience from nature's perspective or the rest of nature's perspective and then you've got the negative experiences that people might um experience and yeah i think those intricacies are, are, are not had so much exposure i mean we know that negative that, that kind of negativistic relationship where we come up against the the things that aren't so pleasant in the natural world are, are related to a, a lower level of nature connectedness. So, yeah, I think it's it's certainly something that we have to consider. But it's it's not had a it's not had a, a huge amount of um, research, and it, and obviously it differs in different nations as well. What is that? Thankfully, in the UK, there's there's not too much uh, to be genuinely fearful of in nature, but obviously changes in in different parts of the world and people have very different relationships and are used to dealing with those potential um, threats. That's great. Thank you, Miles. Um, so I'm afraid I think that's all the, the questions that we have time for. Um, but I'm so glad that we were able to generate some really interesting discussion and hopefully everyone was able to take away something new something inspiring from our speaker today um so i'd just like to say thank you again miles for taking the time to talk to us um if you want to share your contact details or anything in the meeting chat now if anyone wants to get in contact with you 
um, you're welcome to do so. And hopefully uh, we will also see you again. Uh, we're planning our future webinars. So the next of which is currently planned for the 31st of July, that's Monday, again from 6 till 7 p.m. Um, and that will be about the UK's nature education strategy. So we're also open to suggestions for any future topics, or if you have a topic you'd like to present as a speaker, um, you can get in contact about collaboration opportunities, projects, anything like that. We love to be in touch with members and non-members alike, um, so please do let us know. Alternatively, if you're watching this as a recording, anyone, um, please do get in contact and comment below any topics that you'd like us to focus on in future webinars. Um, and I'd just like to thank you all for attending this webinar. We appreciate your time and input, and you can learn about our upcoming webinars and any other updates by following us on our social media by searching IUCN NC UK. Thank you all and have a wonderful week. Thank you, Miles. Yeah, thanks all. Thanks for the invite.